Hi, and welcome to this week's New School Live event, a conversation on race in the U.S. We're here at the corner of 5th Avenue and 13th Street in downtown New York City at the New School, a comprehensive university with a legacy of engaging with race and social justice. New School Live lets you participate in the kind of conversations that happen on a daily basis here at the university, where students and faculty engage with conversations that spill out of classrooms and into cafeterias and other spaces where new ideas are formed and action takes place. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by Professor Maya Wiley, the New School's Senior, Vice, Senior Director, Senior Vice President for Social Justice, who will be leading New School students in a conversation on race in the United States. It's an interactive conversation, so we want to hear from you. Um, respond to us asking questions or making comments on our social media platforms using the hashtag race in the US. I think we're about ready for the conversation to start Maya so let's begin the conversation. Well welcome and thank you for being here but also thank you for those who are participating via social media. We definitely want you in the conversation and we're gonna start with the question what is race and why does it matter today? Well, I mean, speaking for me, I think, I think race in many ways, um, I, I'm quite aware of being a man of color, especially, you know, now that, you know, Trump won that election. And, and I think in the air, there's a lot of uh, tension. But I think before race is even brought into question, I'm a human being. And that's something that I hope to communicate um, as avidly as I can, that you know, I think race in some ways is a wedge. It separates us. Um, the categorizing of like people, it, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way. But that's, you know, so that's thing. interesting because you're saying two important things. Mm -hmm. One which is we're all people, which is consistent with all the research, which is race has no biological meaning, mm -hmm. right? It only has a socially constructed meaning. So you identify as a human, but you're also aware that there's a social construction sure. around who you are as a man of color. Mm -hmm and that it's changed for you since the election to a certain degree? Yeah, it, I think the election like woke me up. You know, I, I remember coming to class the day after and being on the train and how somber it was. Like New York was like was, in mourning. It was yeah, like something right. you could feel in the air. Feel the tension. Um, yeah, and um, you know, my, uh, one of my professors, Wendy Walters, who I have a lot of respect and admiration for, she, you know, she was impacted by it and encouraged us to like express how we felt in the classroom. Um, and uh, we all united, and it was beautiful. I think after Trump's election, I became, I think, less apologetic about my blackness, about what I represented, about um, getting more educated. And the new school has been a great like catalyst for that, I mm -hmm. think. Do um, others have a different mm -hmm. or experience or view? And was race different for you before the election and then after? Does it have a different meaning? I think that, for me, race has always sort of been a part of how I experience the world, right? My blackness informs my feminist, my blackness informs my queerness, my blackness informs um, spaces of my youth and spaces that I've grown up in and spaces that I hope to inhabit. Um, and while those things are oftentimes maybe saw or, or interpreted as a wedge or a way it allows people to draw spaces between us, mm -hmm. it also creates a sense of togetherness, right? Mm -hmm. There is something, you know, science tells us often that when we are in spaces where we share an aspect of our identity with other people, we feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sharing spaces with folks who identify as black, sharing spaces with folks who identify as black and femme or as black and queer, like those intersections of our identities allow us a sense of togetherness and a, a sense of closeness that is very important, um, especially in the age of 45, right, where so often we're told that we don't need those spaces or we're all, you know, out here trying to be special snowflakes when we're really trying to, to feel good and feel good together. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to take both of those things in consideration when you're thinking about how race impacts you from so day to day. So there's how we construct our identities around race, and then there's how we are raced. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And then the complicated set of identities we have that are also beyond race. So what is race? Wilton. <laughs> oh, well, I was gonna say, yeah. It's funny, because yeah, when you, when you asked that question, I thought of it as, um, as a sort of internal factor and in how you identify as a race, mm -hmm. um, or, 
yeah, and then how race is also like externalized, and then there's that sort of individual aspect and also the collective aspect mm -hmm. and the assumptions that people make about you because of your mm -hmm. race, mm -hmm. um, and people might not know anything about you, and yeah. yeah. Hi, um, when I moved here, I'm from Mississippi, so race, because I'm from the South, because I um, always knew and understood what the civil rights movement was and what it, what it still is about. Um, when I moved here, I realized how fluid um, race could be, because um, I was living in Washington Heights, and uh, there was a lot of Spanish-speaking folks, and they would walk right up to me and start speaking Spanish, because they looked at me and figured, you know, you must be something similar, and I am, we're, we're all human. Yeah. But I realized that it was so fluid, so different. Um, and that, you know, race isn't, isn't genetic, it's, it's a construct. It was created and um, it changes all the time. It changes, we've learned now based on uh, religion, based on laws, based on um, how you engage. You know, you, you'll be, you know, racialized in some way. Well, this is interesting. So part of what you're saying is phenotype, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Absolutely. way you appeared, but phenotype doesn't necessarily answer the question, how is race constructed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could be phenotypically black, you could be phenotypically Latino, because mm -hmm. we have Latinx, I should say, yeah. right mm -hmm. now, but because we have the, the African diaspora right. is not just continental, yes. mm -hmm. right? That's right. why it's a diaspora, mm -hmm. which is why some folks can also have self-identities that are different from how they're being raced based on how they appear. And look very similar yeah. and be from a yeah. million different places. But now, yeah. Kalina, yeah. you're also from Mississippi. Yes, I know, coincidentally. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Do you have connection. a different experience with race and what it feels like for you based on both where you grew up but also being here in New York now? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I also am not born in the U.S. I came to Mississippi when I was a little over seven years old and have spent most of my life in Greenville, which is um, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. And I think race is a lot about othering and what you're not. So people in Mississippi especially, when it's dominantly black and white, and you see an Asian person, which when I was there, it was 0.9% Asian, you're not either black or white, but what exactly are you? Yeah. Um, it was kind of one of the questions I got, and, and that looked very different when um, I went to the Boston area for college and now being in New York. In these different spaces, um, people assume a lot of things based on these phenotypes, right? And then they have different conversations with you once they figure out the other components of identity, as you were mentioning, these intersections, right. yeah. And race is not individual, is part of what you all yeah. are saying, mm -hmm. right? In yeah. other words, you can be, it's not just what we think we are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to say I wasn't born black, but I've been black all my life. Mm -hmm. But that's right. because of how I've been treated by society, mm -hmm. right? And from policy to mm -hmm. opportunity to assumptions that people make about me. But what does that mean? What is the group, when we're talking about groups, right? It's not just how we interact with race individually. Mm -hmm. What meaning does race have today in society, do you think? Well, like a couple people touched on, um, there's a lot of assumptions about what you're not. Not only what you are not phenotypically, um, but things you are not able to do, things you do not know, um, things you cannot be ever um, because of the well, history of racialized. Well, apparently you can be trans black now. Uh, look, that's a thing. <laughs> that's not a thing. That was sarcasm. Um, but I, you know, I went to school in Wisconsin, and explaining to people in Wisconsin, some of whom were like, "You're my first black person ever," and I'm like, first of all, I'm not yours. <laughs> Second of all, cool. Uh, I whatever it is that you have in your mind about blackness, um, I probably don't fit it because I am a black girl from Brooklyn, and maybe the images you've seen on television are of black people from what could be a thousand different places on the planet, right? And like, blackness is not a monolith. Latinx is not a monolith. You know, people are people, individuals, and, and their individual experiences of race mm -hmm. and other things affect the way that they show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And so often, this idea of being racialized means you're sort of lumped in together with everybody who looks like you when everybody knows that that's not really a thing. Well, except we have genetic tests now, so we say it's not biological, oh. and yet you are bombarded, bombarded with ads about figuring out what your 
genetic history is in a very racialized way mm -hmm. as at the same time that we're saying, but we all carry 99% of the same DNA, mm -hmm. genetic material. Mm -hmm. So there is a construct that's happening around groups and race, and we should say something we haven't said. Um, we all have one that's constructed for us, it, including people who are white. Mm -hmm. I mean, we often talk about race as if it's only people who are not white, mm -hmm. and then it's defined against as something, whiteness is the opposite of everything, of, else. Of everything else, right? <laughs> right? Which is its own way of racializing white people, right? right? People who are white. So I think it's important for us to say everyone has a constructed race. Absolutely. And racial identity, whether they own it or accept it or agree with it, right? right? Mm -hmm. Or not. And, and I think, so why? And I think, and I think you touched upon a good point. I think like confronting like the topic is like in itself like so good for us to do. And I, d I don't think a lot of people are willing to talk about like what separates us um, and acknowledging, you know, acknowledging the presence of, you know, people of color um, as I think humans, as like, you know, just without, without tacking on like these like false assumptions that this country was kind of built upon, like, you know, you can look at it up, you can look it up, it's there, it's, it's fact that you know slaves and um, slavery and reconstruction and what that did um, it, it goes deeper than trail just of tears yeah. and creating reservations for native populations Japanese anti internment. Japanese internment mm -hmm. uh, preventing mm -hmm. Chinese mm -hmm. immigration mm -hmm. racializing immigration policy to say you had to be white to be able to get legal status within the country we have these histories that have racialized mm -hmm. groups in many different ways and what's interesting about that is people who now our race is white, we're not always. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, what work do you think race is doing in society? Why are we socially constructing it, uh, particularly today? And post-election, it seems to be happening increasingly. Yeah, right? as a person of Jewish descent, I find this particularly interesting mm -hmm. because like, I have certain privileges as a white male that I might not have if the country was entirely white. I might be treated very differently if it was predominantly waspy, so to speak, and how, um, you know, we talked in the course about Irish immigrants when they first mm -hmm. got here as well, and that mm -hmm. race is, and racialization is like a continual process, mm -hmm. so it seems like there's also no real end goal of racism other than dividing people up, right? Because oh. if you could magically, like, commit genocide, to be honest, against like a whole group of people, then it would just be applied to the new people, and it would be constantly splitting mm -hmm. the pie, so to speak, yeah. so there's no... Yeah. So this is a yeah. really, you, you, you've raised something, Wilton, I think it's important to pause on, which is there's what is race, and then there's what is racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we construct race, and we have a history of racism that has helped construct it, meaning mm -hmm. the conscious decision that certain groups of people were inferior to other groups of people. And we also have race as a construct that lives even for people who don't necessarily espouse racism, mm -hmm. at least at a conscious level, mm -hmm. right? Although, one might argue we have a lot more explicit acceptance of racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, I would argue, is a new form of racialism and homophobia, mm -hmm. transphobia, mm -hmm. are, are forms of social construction that we're seeing in process right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what, why? Why do you think? What, what's its relevance now that we continue to socially construct it despite the fact that we have a lot more information about its lack of biological meaning and, and relevance. I, I think it's still based on a lot of fear. I think um, because people, we, we take a lot of time to have conversations um, among each other, but in a lot of places where, um, you know, it's just one type of group, like in Wisconsin, is some of those areas are, are really white. And in Mississippi, you go to some areas that are really black. But if, you, if you're at the dinner table at some of those places, mm -hmm. um, the conversations that they have are based, based in fear. I don't know what my white boss is gonna do today. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I saw that, that black guy and he was probably robbing a car, you know. So it's this, these constructions of, um, of negativity just based on fear. And I think if maybe we started having conversations like these more often in other places um, and making sure that similar stories are told, because if you really get down to it, we're all really concerned about 
the same things. Mm -hmm. We want you know healthy experiences for our families. We want to be able to um, make money. Mm -hmm. We want to have success. You know, we want to you know <laughs> <laughs> we want to survive and be happy and you know be content and you know not wake up. In, in anxiety of what you know what the president is going to tweet you know th that day you know so I think what what's constructing it now is is a lot of fear people are afraid if, if they leave the country will they be able to come back mm -hmm. or um, you know if they walk down the street will they will they get stopped by a police officer and they'll you know mistake them scratching you know their shoulder as a reach for a handgun so I think um, now it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. fear based mm -hmm. and I think having a conversation well, changes you, it. Well you said some important mm -hmm. things um, and obviously as an academic institution here yeah. at the New School, we also spend a lot of time trying to unpack why and how these things get created mm -hmm. and how to create solutions, mm -hmm. right? So what are some of the things that you feel that you've learned here on any of those, whether it's the why or the how or the solution that you think is important to lift up? I think you said something really important about having these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this othering tends to come from fear, and fear mm -hmm. comes from a place of scarcity, right? There's not enough for everybody to have enough, so I have to take before someone else does, right? And, mm -hmm. and the conversations that we often end up in are, I have to take it so that I can. Mm -hmm. Not for me, maybe. Maybe for my kid, maybe for my parent, maybe for someone else. People aren't nearly as self-serving as mm -hmm. we would like to believe. Um, but these conversations around identifying, right, around sharing experiences around the experience that I had in Wisconsin and my experiences in Europe and my experiences in Brooklyn, those things are shared things, right? I've had those experiences with other people and those other people have had those experiences with me, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're talking at their dinner tables, right, with their, their Mima and them about, <laughs> <laughs> about those experiences and, and those shared experiences and the ways that we are the same, right, and the ways that there is enough for everyone, um, that I think is, is, is a path towards a solution, right? Is it the whole solution? No, right? Obviously redistrib redistribution needs to happen, obviously um, radical ideas around what is othering and why do we continue to use it mm -hmm. um, need to happen, but those conversations that begin with you and I have the same things that we would like for ourselves and for our families. We want to be happy and we want to be healthy and we want to be loved. Yep. That's a start. Polina, did you have something to add? Absolutely. Um, so I'm in the fashion studies program and one of the key theorists that we go back to is Susan Kaiser. And she has this thing about identity knots. They're also identity knots with a K. So we're trying to untangle them, right? Extending that fashion yeah. metaphor. Yeah. So going to what you were saying, so many of you have said is, Yes, we have a phenotype race, but there's also other aspects of identity, some of which will put us in another marginalized group. And how do these things interact with each other and inform our experience as one whole person mm -hmm. in these various spaces that we are interacting on a day to day? Um, and so for me, my experience um, at the new school, and particularly with my a particular program, is looking at fashion, looking at our clothing that we all have to wear and seeing how we negotiate those appearance politics, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about the fact that it's not a natural condition mm -hmm. to be raced? I mean, mm -hmm. so Amber, you shared examples of segregation, which mm -hmm. are actual constructs yep. that mm -hmm. then drive group-based identity and group-based competition, mm -hmm. right? So we actually, if we segregate space by this thing we construct as race, we also create this sense of group-based competition, tension, challenge, where we don't necessarily have to have it, I think, to your point. But yeah. anything, Ray, you wanna jump in on this? Um, you know, you've mentioned like traveling, and like I know for me, uh, coming to the new school, I grew up here in Brooklyn, and um, my parents uh, came from the Dominican Republic, moved to Brooklyn when nobody wanted to live in Brooklyn. It's like 1985. <laughs> um, Hopefully they bought. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's changed. That's a whole other conversation. Oh, but, um, you know, coming into the new school, I've met so many people from all over the world that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've been engaging and I was encouraged to uh, 
you know, travel abroad and I got to go to, go to France. Mm -hmm. And something interesting about being there um, was that they put my Americanness in front of being a mm -hmm. man of color, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. I never, you know, the discrimination that I kind of saw was, was more targeted towards like Muslims. Mm -hmm. And I remember, oh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. like cops ignoring me, but targeting like yeah. another group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, very it was, it was interesting. <laughs> It's um, a very different construct. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, they have. They own. still have their othering, but it mm -hmm. happens differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. We have a question that came in from RB on our live stream panel that's related to this: the idea of race as being something malleable and mm -hmm. connected to context. Mm -hmm. um, he asks, or she asks, if we use African American, should we also be using European American? And also, are terms like white, brown? helpful or are they just essentializing and totalizing? Mm -hmm. Is there other better language that we can use to help talk about race and find a path to justice? That's, a, I think, an excellent question. That's a great question. What do you all think? It's hard. Like, I often am like, I don't know that I feel comfortable using mm -hmm. African American, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, I have this beautiful Yoruba name and my family is very proud of, like, as much as our history as we can trace back, um, mm -hmm. you know, we know we're from West Africa, but I have, having gone to Morocco and, and thinking about traveling more in Africa, I don't know that I feel a strong connection to this place that I have never been and, and don't know very much about like my personal existence mm -hmm. and the way that it could have been mm -hmm. in that space. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, oftentimes when people say things like, you know, I am African American, right? I ask, you know, mm -hmm. are, is your family from Africa, right? Were you born there? Mm -hmm. Were you an immigrant? Um, when mm -hmm. people say they're Caribbean Americans, I'm all often like, yes, <laughs> I'm from Pick an Island. <laughs> 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 you know, and that experience is very different. And other the people from other islands. Right, and then <laughs> I, I'm not Haitian, I'm um, right. Jamaican, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh no, everyone's gonna come for me on my social media. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's for me it's it's very this question of language is very interesting because so many i would ask the same thing of someone who said well i'm european american i would say well what country in europe are you from right and so um, right the language the limitation of language um creates this these these barriers yeah. right these isolationist things mm -hmm. when some folks are like well i'm just black or i'm just mm -hmm. brown right mm -hmm. and oh. that's that's the thing I, Another? I'm actually afraid, um, and I'll admit being afraid, um, because in situations where where we're, we all get swirled in, mm -hmm. and uh, it gets neutral, mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, you see the shift happen where othering happens in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I, it, that feels good, and it feels like super idealistic, but. Um, I think it's important to identify and name at this point because a lot of people are suffering in different ways. Mm -hmm. I think as America matures and I think as uh, you know the generations are educated and we start talking about the truth for real, <laughs> yeah. you know, we can start to shed some of these constructs which I see happening all the time um, through those conversations. But right now I think um, naming and having conversations and being honest about what we don't know and where we come from and why we call each other what we call each other. Um, because as as people, we, we have a, a need to want to organize in some way mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, you know. My, my yeah. example on this would be um, that when we, when, when, when Jesse Jackson proposed that we move from black to African American as a way to recognize the diaspora and own the mm -hmm. identity in a different way and broaden it, um, that, uh, when we look at the statistics of outcomes for black people in the United States, they have continued to get worse despite the change mm -hmm. from black to African American. Mm -hmm. So in terms of mortality, health disparity, <clears throat> wealth and income disparity, social mobility, uh, we've made tremendous progress in this country, but there are also a number of indicators that have gotten worse. And so I tend to think structurally, like this is why I like mm -hmm. to pose the question, how are we racing? Mm -hmm why are we doing it, and what are the kinds of things that create a different structure of interaction, of experience, of opportunity, so that we're seeing each other more as a collective, as a we, mm -hmm. um, while we're able to recognize and own also how we're positioned differently, and what our different cultural representations are, because we've got them, mm -hmm. and that's something we also want to hold on to and embrace as a positive. 
right? This is one of the things that makes the U.S. great is the incredible richness of our, all the cultures that are made up here. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we I have, have another? A, yeah, I have a question that came in from Facebook that's connected to this part of the conversation about race and its connection to oppression and discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, conversations about uh, discrimination often seem to be who's being the most oppressed? The oppression is this, Olympics. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> who, who, is this relevant, and if so, why? Or if not, how do we address this flawed topic or flawed concept yeah. of the question? Mm -hmm. So I think I tend to talk in terms of group-based position. Okay. Uh, which is to say, when we look at how people are grouped and then the opportunities and challenges that they have by group, that that tells us what we have to pay attention to. And then that's not a valuing of one form of discrimination or exclusion from one group over another, but rather to say, how do we think about how we target solutions based on how we're positioned differently? Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it just plays into, you know, I think what Ashoke was talking about in terms of competing for what a, starts to get created as limited resources mm -hmm. rather than saying, I think as everyone here said, mm -hmm. we all want to, right, mm -hmm. do well. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to understand how by group we are differently positioned to ensure how to get there, mm -hmm. right? Do others have a different view? Absolutely. I think that should be nothing but fervor for coalition building. Uh, for me, as a Chinese immigrant, I am aware of my, I guess, former nation's um, exclusion history in the U.S. context. So um, earlier this year when I saw the Muslim ban, especially as a professional who works in immigration law, I'm personally and professionally invested. Mm -hmm. And I think um, especially for other Chinese immigrants, Chinese Americans who recognizes our own history, we should be out there and saying, hey, we're not going to let this happen mm -hmm. again to anybody else. Right. A great example. There, the one that came to my mind is every time we've made um, advances for particular groups who have been marginalized by society, we're usually making advances for more than that group. So mm -hmm. yeah. if you take the example of expanding health care, uh, there were also things built into health care reform to understand particular groups that needed different kinds of supports and interventions, mm -hmm. whether it was women's health benefits um, that had to be included in an essential package, uh, things that targeted uh, disparities that showed up in particular communities, mm -hmm. often because they've been disinvested in, in particular ways, but so that they're programs that target unique forms of um, lack of health and health mm -hmm. access. It's a great example of how everyone benefited, but it also targeted different groups mm -hmm. based on need, yeah. since the yeah. goal was health. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Like Dave and Chanel talked right. about this um, on Monday, sort of uh, organizing from the margins, right? Mm -hmm. So like understanding yes. who is the most negatively impact, impacted yeah. by what's going on in any given situation and addressing their needs with the understanding that if those needs are addressed first, everyone else's needs will be addressed as well, right? Yeah. And I think that idea um, is something that more and more individuals are starting to, to really think about when it comes to policy, when it comes to community organizing, when it comes to lobbying, when it comes to hiring. What can I do for the folks who are most negatively impacted, you know, black trans women in the United States mm -hmm. who are between the ages of 15 and 25? Mm -hmm. Yep. Think, about, think yeah. about the statistics yeah. around yeah. life expectancy, yeah. around health, around right. employment, around having More likely home. to be killed. Yeah. Yeah, more likely, likely to, to be more jobless, jobless, homeless, homeless, mentally ill, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. All of the things that, that are literally holding this person um, from, from living their best life. And if you address those things in policy and those things in practice and those things in, in your interaction with that person, that means all of the other people who maybe don't share that interaction, maybe don't share those intersections, will be positively affected by your ability to see that person as a person. The other right. very salient point for today's world is domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. So if we continue to other Muslims, we ignore yeah. mm -hmm. folks who are very dangerous to our society who were born here, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who are racialized white, mm -hmm. 
and who are typically not surveilled in the same way and for whom we don't seek intervention, including mental health intervention, mm -hmm. uh, because I believe there should be a mental health solution as well for, I for helping to identify supports that people need before they turn to this kind of domestic violence. And when we, we think about terminology, I don't think in the papers I saw the Vega shooter be identified as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And it's like something we're quick to do for, you know, Anybody else. Anybody else. Really yeah, anyone. anybody else. And it's like, yeah. he's, he's not committing an act of terror, like, just because of the whiteness that's kind of, like, like, right there in front of our eyes, you know? And what makes um, that exempt? What makes him exempt? And, you know, when I thought of the question about oppression, it's like, there shouldn't be, again, this, like, it's, it, it's equality that we want, right? Um, and the, in coalition, like, working together, um, I don't, I think, just finding ourselves in unity is like the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, and it, being aware yeah. of what we, the words we choose, mm -hmm. um, for That's sure. Cool. I think yeah. acknowledging each other's trauma is mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. um, when that whole wave of joblessness uh, hit, it was a lot of families, black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine Asian. what that does mm -hmm. to your self-efficacy mm -hmm. when you cannot provide for your family. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who, who dealt with that in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, when um, the police were raiding black communities and taking them, uh, pretty much kidnapping them mm -hmm. and throwing them in jail for years at a time, the trauma that happened to a family then. So it's like acknowledging our trauma in different levels and sharing those mm -hmm. stories. I, I think that's just a, a way to move us forward, yeah. I had a question that came in from Instagram that's related to finding solutions and using the tools that we have at hand. Um, someone's asking in today's troll culture, how can we use the internet and social media to mitigate rather than aggravate racial tensions? Excellent question. You could blunk, uh, block Trump on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> First do that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Well, it, 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 it's, it's gotten so much more complicated because there's also a concerted political effort to troll to create racial division, mm -hmm. right? And that's some of the information that's come up in the Russia interference investigations. Right. I mean, so it's also become a national security issue, right, to mm -hmm. think about how we protect ourselves from this kind of divisiveness online. Mm -hmm. But what are your experiences? What are your solutions? I mean, I think trolls, so like we grew up in the age of the internet, right? And so we were the first people to, to see a troll on Reddit. Mm -hmm. Right YouTube. back, back in the day, <laughs> um, or to see trolls in, in chat rooms when AOL chat rooms were still a thing. Oh wow! And now you're <laughs> I remember my screen. <laughs> right. That's good times. Um, but also, we we are the first people to to understand how to take time mm -hmm. to deal with a troll. Right. There are entire there are now entire groups of white people on Facebook who you can tag in to an argument around race around um, queerness, around class, right? Who will do the argument for you because you're like, this is a thing for me, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a trigger or this is a really difficult topic or I just don't have time to argue with these people today. And they mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. right? And so like what are ways, other ways that people are saying, I'm not gonna let the trolls win. Well, uh, part of what I hear you saying is they're are new forms of organizing that take into account that social space is also online, mm -hmm. that it's also technological, it's mm -hmm. social media platforms, and that we do organizing around how to impact the conversation, protect people in the conversation. I think what becomes particularly scary, uh, and when Linda Sarsour was here for our, our race course, um, the fact that she had to be here with a bodyguard yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because of the death threats that she gets on so social media largely for saying things like, we have to take care of each other, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally what her message is, mm -hmm. that as a Palestinian American woman, she sees herself as needing to take responsibility for what happens to undocumented immigrants or for people who have been subject to police brutality or the criminal justice system unfairly or, right? I mean, that, that she's actually been a coalition builder across a whole mm -hmm. bunch of different other rings right. and yet is in danger now as a result of being right. very outspoken about it. But So there's also this way in which I think we have to think about our, our forms of protection in the analog world mm -hmm. <laughs> because right. of what happens, uh, because you don't always know if it's just a threat or if it's actually someone's going to act now on that threat. And yeah. I think we have to find ways to organize so that those are safe spaces.
but safe meaning we take care of each other in it. As yeah. I think that was an excellent example of ways we can do that. Yeah, I agree. I think social media could be a tool for good and also a tool for people to troll and yeah. like you know piss other people off, share messages that aren't beneficial. Right. Um, I tend to like ignore most trolls online. Um, it comes with the territory, Some especially days. when you get political. <laughs> sometimes it's you like, have time. <laughs> yes. it's, it comes with the block. territory, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, block. you do block. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. But I think that uh, I think one of the important things to lift up is that we at the New School actually teach to these things, right? Mm -hmm. So we have we have a range of classes on technology and society. Mm -hmm. I teach a digital equity lab. David Carroll, who's in, um, uh, is actually a professor here, who's launching a campaign around. Um, how to get our voting data back mm -hmm. uh, from, from those who take our data and then misuse it in this way of targeting fake news, bots. So I think there are also all these ways in which being in a university community also helps us create solutions and tools uh, that take into account how technology is changing society. I think we're about out of time, but I wanted oh, to really? thank everybody. Yes, everybody <laughs> for their participation. But we're not done. We haven't solved I know. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, neither is the viewing audience, because there's a lot of questions on live stream that you can go to visit the live stream and see other comments and questions that have come in. And also, I wanted to remind viewers that this is part of Race in the U.S., a class that is a, an example of the way the, u the university has pivoted to address things going on in the world today with a curricular offering that is also online. If you go to the newschool.edu forward slash race in the US, you can visit our Medium page and follow some of the action and see the lectures that are there online um, and add more your comments, continue to um, participate and engage in this conversation. I'd like to also use this as an opportunity to thank you, Professor Wiley, as well as all the students here from the New School for their time and the viewing audience. I think this is a great example of how we can together unpack some of these conversations and look at the nuance of race and ultimately get to a place of social justice and action around that. So thank you from all of us at New School Live and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>